Hello, I'm Rod Fritz, WB9KMO from Mesa, Arizona. And I'm one of those hamsters that's going to be showing you our introduction to digital amateur television. The history of television goes back 100 years and hams were pioneers in the 1920s. And uh, today we've come a long, long way. Um, amateur radio operators now use television in digital mode using DVB-T and DVB-S. And we'll be describing that alphabet soup to you a little bit later. TV began with mechanical spinning discs. And uh, that wasn't going anywhere very fast, but it was certainly a big stretch from audio to be able to see things. Then Philo T. Farnsworth developed this little electronic tube camera and um, we also have CRTs, so now we can do television with uh, electronics instead of mechanical things. It made a world of difference. And then more recently, we have solid state cameras and flat screen TVs. And finally, we switched from analog television to digital television, and we'll describe a lot about that later. So you'll need this uh, ATV studio equipment in your ham shack. So just a quick review, you're gonna need at least one video monitor or a digital TV to watch what's going on. You'll need uh, video sources, at least one camera of a sort, but there are several other options. Lighting is very important so that uh, we can see you and in all of your glory. And uh, most people use computers and software, a software package called vMix and we'll describe that. Video switch is handy if you have multiple inputs. And uh, the one we like is ATEM Mini. And I will show you a picture of that. Then we're gonna talk about transmitters and antennas and receivers and antennas. And uh, they're a little bit different from other transmitters and receivers uh, that you might be aware of. Uh, video sources include camcorders. You're pretty comfortable with those. Uh, for digital, we like HDMI outputs and webcams. Webcams usually have USB outputs, but usually they're connected to a computer and you can get HDMI output from the computer. Laptops with built-in cameras are pretty slick. Everything's all in one place. You just use the HDMI output on the laptop and away you go. That's what you connect to your transmitter or your switch if you're gonna switch different sources. Ah, lighting. Proper lighting is important. You wanna make sure you don't have too much black or too much white in the picture. And getting that balance is a little tricky sometimes. The best lighting is usually uh, from three lights spaced around the object. And uh, the key light is the one in front. You want it about 30 degrees over your head and forward of you. And then fill lights would be on the side and uh, they get rid of shadows and give you enough light for a really nice picture. I hope this is working. That's what I have here. Uh, another video source is security cameras and those are a lot of fun. Another video source is a video phone. And that's kind of nice because they have built-in computers, usually running the Android system. And what's nice about that is that you can bring up things like the mesh network, and then they have HDMI outputs that you can connect to your switch or your transmitter. And uh, another video source that's really handy are video files that you've recorded one way or another. You can just play the files through your computer and output the HDMI uh, into your transmit system. You can select video with a video switch. Um, there are a couple of ways that are commonly uh, done. On the right, you see an ATEM Mini, which is an electronic switch. And um, a lot of switches will cause delays, but this one is very quick. So we highly recommend this. And uh, that you just plug your HDMI inputs into it. And you have an HDMI output then that goes to your transmitter. On the left, you see a screen from a PC. And 
you do the switching there with your PC using a program called vMix. It's a free program unless you get really fancy and want a lot of inputs, but you get four inputs for free. Highly recommended to try this. And uh, again, the inputs go into your computer one way or the other, and then you use the HDMI output to go into your transmitter system. Thank you, that's all I've got for now. Let's turn it over to Mike Collis, WA6SVT. Hello, I'm Mike Collis, WA6SVT, and been into amateur television for over 40 years. Well, I guess that makes me uh, an elder. <laughs> First, we'll talk about uh, comparing the spectrum of a DVB-T narrowband 2 megahertz bandwidth signal versus a uh, 6 megahertz wide vestigial sideband ATB signal. And screen on the left is uh, 2 megahertz. And as you can see, it has kind of a haystack effect. So you have full power uh, over slightly less than 2 megahertz bandwidth. <clears throat> and in the case of 434 megahertz, we do that so that we stay out of the 432 weak signal and the Oscar satellite band uh, above 435. In the case of the AM signal at 434 megahertz, most of the power is at the visual carrier. Uh, most of the lower uh, uh, carrier is cut off, and then there's an oral carrier at the very far right of the screen, and the little fuzzy stuff in between is the video sidebands. Uh, so kind of comparing the uh, analog to uh, uh, digital, let's jump into our next slide, which is a basic DVB-T digital system. We use a uh, typically a high definition TV camcorder, or you can use standard definition NTSC and up, upgrade it. We use a DVB-T exciter modulator, and then we drive a very linear amplifier and then off to our antenna. A receiver for best uh, sensitivity, we recommend a preamplifier followed by a, a high des uh, or other brand DVB-T receiver and then into your high definition monitor. Our next slide shows a picture of some of the high des and uh, amplifier equipment. High des receivers on the left and on the right is a amplifier by K86HTV video and an exciter by high des and then a high definition camcorder. Uh, we talked about very linear amplifiers. A good example of that is a high power version <clears throat> on the left that's good for 10 watts. These are great for your base station or you can use them for an ATV repeater. Uh, if you want to run portable uh, for like ARES or other emergency services, a smaller three watt version is a little easier to uh, take, although you can use the high power if you've got room in your backpack or wherever for that. Next slide is analog ATV transfers and receivers, and there's still quite a bit of analog activity. On the far left is a um, earlier version of the K86HTV transmitter using a vestigial sideband exciter uh, embedded in the uh, front panel and one of his amplifiers all in one case. To the right of that, uh, with the black face, is one of the PC electronics uh, transceivers. Uh, that one's a TC70, I believe. Those are still available on the used market. And then below, on the left, is an MFJ transmitter, 5 watts maximum uh, peak sync, um, about 2 or 3 watts average. And to the right of that is a 1 watt AEA transmitter available on the used market. That is a vestigial sideband transmitter. So two vestigials and two, uh, the other two, the PC and the MFJ are full AM. There's no uh, filtering in the lower sideband. <clears throat> if you want to operate or receive ATV on the 23 centimeter band or higher bands, uh, down converter is typically used. Our example here is a K86HTV model T3-7 uh, or on the used market, the PC Electronics TVC 12S and E. There's three or four different versions, both crystal controls, synthesized, and VFO that Tom had over the years. If you want to extend your range on uh, from uh, simplex to repeater, 
Uh, here's a basic DVBT repeater. This one's in band, so it's transmitting and receiving within 70 centimeters. And uh, this is one that uh, K86HTV video can build for you if you'd like it, or you can buy the modules and put it together yourself. Our next slide shows a much larger ATV system. This is part of the amateur TV network. This is our hub repeater at Santiago Peak. We have a 5910 uh, FM transmitter, a 1253 vestigial sideband transmitter that will soon be switched to DVBT. It currently has DVBT uh, on 434, uh, vestigial sideband on 434, and FM input on 2441.5, and a bunch of link radios and voice and control systems. Our next slide here, this is a, a basic map of our link repeater systems in the tri-state area. Uh, we also have chapters in other countries. The green the lines are the active ones, the red ones are under construction. Sources for equipment. Um, currently, hides.com.tw, they're out of Taiwan, and they are ATVers who uh, have a commercial business, and they do the they have a modified version of their equipment for ham radio, which is very nice of them. And then kh6htv.com, um, he sells the amplifiers that work really well with the high des equipment. And he also has analog FM, and he can supply the uh, vestigial sideband uh, exciters as well. He has uh, down converters and uh, uh, amplifiers. Then we have mfj.com, and they have just the AM transmitter. Uh, for uh, the 70 centimeter band. That's it for the equipment. Look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mike. Hello, I'm Roland, Roland Hoffman, KC6JPG. I'm the Digital Systems Director for the Amateur Television Network, and I'm also the Net Control Operator for our Southern California and Nevada Chapter 4 ATN. Well, how did I get started? Well, in 1993, I wanted to watch NASA Select and watch the space shuttle programs while they're on a mission. And I had cable, and I did not ha have the luxury of having NASA Select in a, with my cable television service. So I heard that one of the ATV repeaters do transmit the uh, space shuttle program when the uh, shuttles are in a mission. And so I bought a down converter, I got some low-loss coax, and I got a beam antenna, and I fixed it towards the direction of Mount Wilson. And as soon as I turned on my down converter and watched it on my TV screen, I saw a guy rocking in a rocking chair, and it had the call signs KA6DPS. And I said to myself, who in the heck is this? <laughs> And so, of course, there was a 2-meter frequency, 146.43, uh, and I got on my 2-meter radio, and I announced myself, and he said, who that? And I announced myself, KC6JPG, and history was made. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, what a ride. Well, every Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, we host the Amateur Television Network's The Weekly Net. And we get people from not just around our system, around the RF uh, region, but throughout the entire world. It has become an international party, and we invite you to join us. And if you're not within our ATN chapter repeater systems, you can always check in on our Whereby system at whereby.com forward slash ATN1. And so I bet the big curious question you might ask is how far has an amateur television signal transmitted? Well, I will tell you. Back in 1994, an ATV distance record has been set. All KH6HME transmitted a beacon signal from high atop Mauna Loa on the island of Hawaii. Now, his signal was first received by Gordon West, WB6NOA, with a distance of 2,509 miles. And of course, you can see the picture right there on the screen. Now in regards to digital amateur television, how far has a digital ATV signal been recorded? Well, so far, back in 2014, a distance of 180 miles DVB-T with 2 megahertz bandwidth simplex 
was successfully received by W8ZCF. Now, how do we measure the signal strength of an ATV signal? Well, you're familiar with the S meter for the voice radios. Well, in a video, we have a different system. We have what we call P units, and a P unit is simply a picture unit. And so when we say P0, well, it's just like the top left of the screen here, where it's just simply all snow. And you can just barely see any kind of uh, resemblance of a picture. P1 is where you start seeing sink uh, bars and some sort of a picture, but it's mostly snow. P2, well, the picture now starts to lock in. You may get some black and white in color, you know, back and forth. Uh, P3, color starts locking in, still a lot of snow. P4, picture looks pretty darn good with a little bit of snow in it. And of course, P5 is closed circuit quality. When we get into digital amateur television, well, guess what? Our pictures, when we're locked in into the system, well, whether it be a repeater or simplex, well, our pictures are P5, pretty much. And any time that we're on what we call the digital cliff, well, that's when we'll start seeing some artifacts like tiling and freeze frames. And then once we're beyond uh, the range, then it will just simply just lock up as a freeze frame or no picture at all, like a black picture. The signals that you're looking at on this chart compares between VUSB, or known as vestigial upper sideband, compared with FM modulation and DVBT, QPSK modulation. VUSB, as you can see, you'll start being detected just above minus 100 uh, D, dBm, and then you'll start getting a, a closed circuit P5 picture at approximately it's minus 60 dBm. FM TV, pretty much in the same range, um, you can get a full uh, closed circuit quality picture at approximately uh, 83, uh, minus 83 dBm. DVBT, on the other hand, once it receives its signal at approximately uh, 98, uh, minus 98 dBm, and it will lock in, and they will get a pretty much a P5 picture once your signal gets stronger. The United States, the ATV repeaters in the United States, well, we currently have approximately 41 active ATV repeaters throughout the country. 23 repeaters within the country are analog only at this time. And then, of course, 18 of these repeaters are either in the digital mode or what we call mixed modes, where we have digital in with analog out or analog in with digital out. And, of course, we have what we call High, uh, full hybrid, which is either analog, analog, or digital, digital. 21 of these repeaters have an output on 70 centimeter bands, which that means is uh, if you have a cable-ready television set or a cable-ready box, you can simply hook up a beam antenna directly into the back of your TV set, set it on cable channel 59, and you can receive the 434 input signal, or channel 57, for 426.25. Well, some of you are saying, well, you know, that sounds, you know, a lot of fun, but, you know, I really want to watch ATV without investing any equipment, or I'm just simply out of a range of an ATV repeater. Well, how can I watch it? Well, have no fear. All you have to do is go to one of the streaming websites that we're constantly uh, streaming our video. For example, the British Amateur Television Club has a streaming system on their website, which is batc.org.uk forward slash live. And you will see a list of amateur television repeaters currently broadcasting or hamcasting live. And you can watch their uh, video on their, uh, on their players. On the Amateur Television Network, we're streaming on YouTube 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And you can watch us and you can chat with us on youtube.com forward slash amateur television network. We're also integrating amateur television into the mesh system. KC6JPG, that's my call sign. Um, I got uh, a streaming system 
plugged in into the Arden Mesh system. So if you go into the Arden Mesh, just find KC6JPG and you can find a streaming system for the Santiago Peak Repeater system and you can just type in RTSP slash slash W6ATN dash stream dot local dot mesh and of course the port number 554 forward slash live and you can watch our live signal on the Arden Mesh Network. So, big question. Amateur television, what is it used for? Well, that's a big question. Well, four big things to happen with amateur television. One, emergency communications, public service, education, and of course, fun and socializing. Because think about it, amateur television is the original social media network. Emergency communications, well, that comes huge with the amateur television network system. Most of our repeater system have cameras on top of the repeaters on top of the mountaintops. And so, especially here in California where wildfires are, uh, you know, quite frequent every year, uh, these cameras have been very, very useful for emergency operations centers through law enforcement and our uh, fire personnel so they can deploy resources, so they can protect uh, fi uh, protect life and as well as property and whatever resources they need to combat the event. This is a typical picture of an EOC center, emergency operations center, and a lot of emergency operations centers do have down converters or receivers to receive their local amateur television repeater system. And therefore, they'll be able to capture many different events, including watching the wildfires, and so they can deploy resources uh, more effectively. Public service is huge within the amateur television network. We deploy our mobile video truck to many different events to help and engage many different events and help local officials to ensure a successful event, whether it be races, bicycle events, parades, many different events that, th that we serve through our local community. Education is huge with the amateur television network. This is a picture of uh, what we have here is we have Tom, WB6HYH, on the camera, and we have Gary, W6KVC, and they're manning the camera, and Gary's manning the switcher, the San Bernardino Microwave Society's monthly meeting. They have fantastic topics and to really engage the amateur radio community in the hobby of microwave technology. We also have amateur television equipment on board the International Space Station. Pictured is that blue box is simply a 20 watt DVBS transmitter, which is located on the International Space Station. In the future, we're going to continue our digital transition for our ATV repeaters throughout the country. IP linking with ATV repeater systems throughout the country and the world so we can communicate with many ATVers from distant places. Uh, and of course communicating with other ATVers throughout the world using other digital modes including DMR radio where we have a talk group known as ATV Talk 9410. So we encourage you to plug in our talk group onto your DMR radios. And now, I'd like to pass it to Jim Andrews as he'll talk in depth about DVB technology. Hello, I'm Jim Andrews, KH6HTV, and I live in Boulder, Colorado. The KH6 call, though, is because for the past 18 years I've been a retired snowbird living on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands during the winter time. So, DVB-T has become the choice for most digital ATV hams in the U.S. And it is, in fact, the broadcast standard used for almost all the rest of the world, with the sole exceptions of the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and South Korea. In the, this DVB-T, they use either 2,000 or 8,000 closely spaced subcarriers carrying packetized digital data. And it uses three possible modulations. QPSK, which is purely 90 degree phase shifting, 
or two levels of quadrature amplitude modulation, which is both phase shifting and amplitude modulating. DVB-T includes uh, pilot tones in the 8000 subcarriers, and the receiver uses these pilot tones to dynamically characterize the channel and determine the channel's impulse response. It then deconvolves out the signal, eliminating these echoes. Uh, the echoes would have been seen as ghosts on analog TV. And this system also works extremely well for removing Doppler shift. I, in fact, have driven at over 70 miles per hour down the highway, both transmitting and receiving with DVB-T, and encountered no problems. Whereas with uh, ATSC, any Doppler shift at all, and the signal locks up. So what is the differences between these various ones? Well, the biggest difference for us from a ham perspective is the sensitivity of the receiver. With QPSK, we can get down to minus 97 dBm. Uh, we lose 5 dB if we go, go to 16 QAM, and we lose another 10 dB going to 64. Uh, if we add a low noise preamp, we can usually buy about another 3 dB in sensitivity over these numbers. And also, if we go to extremely aggressive forward error correction, uh, we can also buy maybe about another 3 dB. If you want to get by really cheap, a USB TV tuner dongle from, can be had for as little as $10. They're more typically in the $20, $30 range. Uh, these are the same dongles that many hams are already using as wideband SDR receivers. However, I caution you, not everybody's been able to get them to work, especially when they've been problematic on Windows 10, and there are issues of bogus drivers out there. And uh, so, again, good luck. So let's see what these numbers would look like if we take a typical amplifier used in a final in the transmitter. I'm going to run it saturated for FM. I get 65 watts. If I look at where the 1 dB gain compression is on this amplifier, maybe about 50 watts. So if I'm running single sideband, I may in fact run it up to that 1 dB gain compression point at 50 watts peak, PEP. For this same amplifier, if I want to run analog video through it and don't have any compression on the sync pulse, so I'm back in the more, much more linear range, I'm going to rate that probably at about 25 watts. But again, that's going to be peak envelope power at 25 watts. And the average power would be less than that. For digital TV, for this same amplifier, we're going to get 10 watts RMS out of that. So what that means is, we're going to need a minimum of 8 dB headroom in this amplifier to accommodate the peaks in that noise-like digital signal. So these are some typical amplifiers that I build. The one on the left is a high power version, putting out 10 watts RMS for digital actually about 65 to 70 watts if you used it in the FM service. And this one, this would typically be used for base stations and repeaters. The amplifier on the right is a medium power amplifier putting out 3 watts and we use these primarily for portable service in the ARES uh, where they're running off of batteries and you don't want to supply as much current as required by the high ampli the other high power amplifier, especially if you're carrying that battery in your backpack. So I do have amplifiers for all three bands of 70, 33, and 23 centimeters, and they all have at least 50 dB of gain, and they have adjustable power levels where you can drop the power by my, by five to ten, or 10 dB. I want to thank Grant Hoop, Hooper, KB7WSD, for inviting me to talk to you today. 
Grant and Vicki were visitors in our home on Maui for the Maui Ham Club Christmas picnic and barbecue a couple of years ago. And of course, I'd like to say thank you very, very much uh, for the Amateur Television Network, the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, or ARDEN. We'd like to also thank Boulder County Amateur Radio Services, British Amateur Television Club, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, the San Bernardino Microwave Society, YouTube, Art Towsley, WA8RMC, Farrell Winder, W8ZCF, Gary Heston, W6KVC, Jim Andrews, KH6HTV, Kevin Jacobson, AD7OI, and Steve Estes, KB7KWK, for their contributions to this presentation. For more information, you can always contact us through the Amateur Television Network through our website, www.atn-tv.com. You can also contact one of us to, if you need more information. So you can see that right on the screen. So remember, hams love to be seen and heard. And of course, with amateur television, you won't be left behind. Just get on ATV. Thank you very much for watching, and we're here to answer your questions. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I'm here to take your questions, and uh, ho hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to see. Barry, do we have anything uh, on, in chat? Nothing in chat right now. I'm looking for hands up. And I'd like to acknowledge Bill, W2UDT. Thank you very much. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, just kind of give you a little uh, bit of what's going on. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about ATSC 3.0. And of course, ATSC 3.0 is our uh, new standard that we're, you know, broadcasting, um, you know, with the possible, you know, with the, uh, you know, you can do 4K television with uh, uh, with ATSC 3.0. You know, of course, you know, we've been using 8VSB for, you know, quite a while, which is, you know, ATSC 1.0. And of course, and of course, that's the United States. In Europe and a lot of other countries, uses DVB-T or what they call digital video broadcast terrestrial. And of course, satellite or the what do you call free-to-air um, digital satellite. That's DVB-S. And we do have uh, quite a few repeaters uh, that uses the DVB-S technology. One of them is Mount Diablo in Northern California. And uh, Jim K6SOE, he is a huge participant with the um, Amateur Television Network's The Weekly Net on Tuesday evenings. And, of course, I join him on his nets on Thursdays at 8 o'clock Pacific time. And so he uses DVBS technology. Just pick up a free-to-air uh, satellite box, and you can tune in on the frequencies. And with a nice, with a beam antenna, you can tune in on that. With DVBT technology here in the Amateur Television Network, that's we're using it as an input for our ATV systems with an output of 5910 on the FM side. And, and of course, we're still on VSB or vestigial sideband on 1253 on Santiago, 1240 at Mount Wilson, uh, or correction, at uh, Snow Peak, 1265 at Mount Wilson, and 1289 over at uh, Santa Barbara, and uh, Oak Mountain at uh, 919. And uh, we've been uh, playing with, uh, right now we're experimenting with digital output. and. So we're utilizing uh, different methods of uh, outputting, including IP video transmission using whether it be using the Arden network or mesh technology or point-to-point -point technology and using what we call the uh, ATEM switchers, which is a four input switcher. And it has a built-in streaming engine on board, which means that you can either use their proprietary um, streaming server or their streaming bridge which we have up right now at Job's Peak. And so look out, my friends, whoever, you know, if you're going to be participating in the SBMS meetings, and of course with that rising cost of gasoline and how expensive it is to go from Crestline down to Corona with the truck, uh, we're going to be bringing this little puppy, and we're going to be transmitting completely digital from the Corona site all the way up into Job's Peak. We just simply hit this little button right here called On Air, and we're on the air. <laughs> To everywhere. <laughs> Roland, 
Roland, can you uh, move your microphone closer to your mouth? You're kind of low on the audio. Oh, sure. Does it, is this a little better? Yeah, a little bit better. Okay. I, I probably should probably turn it up. So let me turn it up a little bit. How's that? Is that a little better? A lot better. Okay, good. I'm sorry about the low audio. Sorry about that. Marty's got his hand up and so does Peter. I think Marty was first, but I'm not sure. Go ahead, Marty. Okay, thanks. Uh, Roland, thanks for uh, uh, the presentation. Um, when some, if somebody wants to uh, transmit, whether it's uh, portable for, a, uh, uh, for an event or just from home, um, what kinds of cameras work? Are we just talking about the, the standard, uh, uh, you know, like the ones they use in security systems or uh, what, uh, what range of cameras would work and what we, should we be looking for? I'll tell you, you know, with uh, the equipment that's available, both on analog and digital, and of course, analog equipment, you know, you can probably pick up a camera for next to nothing these days because, uh, you know, analog is almost what they call dead in the commercial world. The only thing really existing in analog technology is pretty much uh, what they call VMAG, um, you know, or ImageMag or iMag. And sometimes they'll, you know, if it's a small event, they'll use that. But uh, you can use pretty much any camera that has any kind of an interface, whether it be an analog interface going into an analog transmitter, like the PC electronics that we showed, or getting into digital using uh, HDMI. And any, you know, consumer camcorder use has HDMI outputs. And so you can just feed it right into your HDMI uh, exciter, like the high des transmitters that I use when I transmit digital. And um, so, yeah, any camcorder, I mean, yeah, I can show you a big camera. <laughs> I have an AC90 because I do uh, shooting uh, professionally and I do doc documentaries. And so you can use anything from the smallest little camcorder all the way up to the big uh, commercial, um, you know, documentary or broadcast. Uh, you can use the JVC 660 uh, news cameras that has built in Wi Fi, plug it or and built in USB. You can plug in a um, a Wi-Fi card, and you can go right into your favorite, uh, let's say, vMix software. You can go NDI technology, and you'll be live wirelessly on that type of technology. Uh, another technology, and let me go and grab that, is uh, streaming boxes. And what you can do with streaming boxes, which is really, really cool, is you can take any camcorder, you can put this little guy up. This is a Cerevo Live Shell X. And you see these three LEDs? Well, that represents you know, each service. So for example, I can stream YouTube and I can stream Facebook or I can do RTSP. And RTSP is simply being a server. And so if you take your software like OBS Studio, which is completely free, or you take vMix, uh, or any kind of video capturing using RTSP, you can go network and you can link up to RTSP, you can link up to your camcorder. And this is the perfect way to, let's say, go to Dayton and you have your camcorder you know, with this little box on top and you'll be pretty much wireless um, all the way through the event, going right into our switchers and then of course onto the monitors or out on the repeaters, that type of thing. So, you know, you know, the, the limitations to your imagination is just amazing. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. And what's okay. really amazing, too, is these little guys, Raspberry Pis. And people are, are actually making like SDR radio type of projects using, S, you know, using Raspberry Pis, DVB-T receiving, and, uh, and of course, using, uh, let's say, the... Um, uh, the um, digital video express boards that they were making using the pies as the engine. So pies have been very, very fun. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be programming this guy as a streaming bridge decoder, and it's going to go to up to another one of our hills and we'll be able to do IP video from anywhere in the world into our repeater systems. And I can, I can do the net when I'm fishing in Minnesota. <laughs> okay. Well, don't fish there now. I think they're a little cold. It, just a little bit. My, my family's been ice fishing quite a bit, so and I have been ice fishing, so it's actually pretty fun. A little, yes. little cold, but it is fun. But it's really fun when you go into an ice house and you've got the propane stove, you've got the venison simmering on the stove, on the top of the stove, and you've got your hole, you're staring at a hole, and you see your little pole go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Crappie. Yay. <laughs> I hope he's not too big for the hole. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes those northerns can be a challenge, but uh, 
my brother-in-law definitely can, uh, he got one out of a hole and it was a good size one too. So yeah, I got, a, I got a nice musky hanging on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you've had your hand up for a while. Take it away. Take it away. Okay. Uh, oh, heavens. Is my audio working? Oh, yes. perfectly. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, I just was uh, thinking during the presentation about amateur radio and our licensing. And one of the caveats is you're not supposed to be broadcasting. That is correct. So how does amateur television get around that? Well, how amateur television gets around that is simply put, we have to adhere by the part 97 rules, which means that it's just like any amateur radio communication, you have to communicate to other amateurs. And of course you're interfacing with two way communication. So if you notice, if you go to our SBMS meetings that, you know, during our break or during uh, check-ins, we drop our picture so other people can, you know, communicate and check in via the amateur television network. So yes, you cannot play mu music. You cannot be a DJ. That's definitely taboo. You cannot violate any kind of uh, copyright, uh, you know, laws. Uh, you cannot play, you know, uh, commercial videos or movies or anything like that. You know, video, we encourage ma people making videos. We really encourage people like family vacations or, you know, repeater site tours, um, you know, anything involved, you know, you, you, something involved with your family, something fun, as long as it's not commercial and it's uh, not copyrighted, not commercially copyrighted. So, so, in other words, so, in other words, if you didn't make it, don't air it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that answer your question there, Peter? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Barry, how are we doing in chat? We are good in chat. Okay. And I don't see more hands up. I'll call out there again. Anybody got uh, a question? Oh, don't be shy. If you want to know about, more about our repeater systems or, you know, what kind of beam antennas that we use, what kind of coax that we use. Um, Nick, get your hand up. Go ahead. Nick. And I wasn't sure that anyone, you know, gave it a chance, but uh, log into our YouTube channel. You'll see our live color bars, you know, when no one's on the air. And uh, so when someone's on the air, you'll be able to, you know, hear their video and audio on YouTube. And we're streaming this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Ooh, we'll try again. Nick, KJ7QEB, are you there, Texas? Well, he's got his hand. While, he, while he's waiting, I do have a question. Can you put a system like this on a drone and do disaster surveying from the air? You sure can. As a matter of fact, a lot of our drones have uh, 59, you know, 58 uh, megahertz. And you can stream that signal back. And uh, like I said, you can put it onto OBS Studio or our uh, uh, video land, the v, you know the, the video land player because they actually re receive um, uh, network and the network video from drones, and yes, you can definitely utilize that. So very very useful. As a matter, well, it's well, funny. Funny, we actually got contacted by a drone operator, and he contacted um, uh, Mike WA six SVT. He was flying his, you know, he was preparing to fly his drone. He was over at the um, San Fernando Valley, very close to our Oak Mountain. And so we transmitted 5910 megahertz from Santiago receiving into Ord. And it's point to point. We used we use a dish. Well, he happened to be right in that that focal point of our dish. And so when he started, he actually was on 5910 to receive his drone video. And what does he see? He sees a guy says W6 MAF, and he takes a gun, his plastic little ray gun, and he goes, shoot the pitcher. <laughs> and, oh, you, you should have heard this guy when he was talking with Mike. He got so scared. He's like, who was that? He thought he was being invaded. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, told, I told Mike he should have got his name. He could have turned him into an amateur radio operator, and you can use his drone for ATV. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, are you on there yet? Hello, Nick. Okay, hey. so Nick is going, I'm going to chat. Sorry about the audio problems. Go ahead, Nick, chat away. 
he hasn't submitted his question yet. So, but Marty has his hand up. Okay, so he's asked. There he is. So he's asking: Analog ATV can be received on channel thirteen or cable channel sixty, correct? If you're if you're using DVBT, which is not used in America. Okay, so in regards to analog um, amateur television receiving, of course, um, we use four thirty four megahertz um, here in uh, in California as a transmit, and of course, that's an input into our repeater system. And that's actually cable channel 59. And so, of course, channel 13 is uh, like, uh, what, uh, four, three, two, one, like 199, or actually channel 13 is actually higher, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Uh, so that'd be like 211 megahertz. So, and since we're on the 400 or 70 centimeter band, uh, you'll have to get a, whether it be a, a, a set top box uh, that's on the cable mode, and or a find an old TV set that has cable, and of course you slick it into the cable mode, and then you can tune it in channel 59, and there you go. You have yourself a receive an ATV receive station just by putting up an antenna and low loss coax right into the back of your TV set, and of course uh, we recommend a, a preamp uh, for that. And so this way you can actually watch a, a simplex ATV just by using a TV set and an antenna. And that's the analog system. And that's the analog. Digital, you'll have to get a receiver. And so with DVB-T, um, we use for, you know, we use, uh, of course, most DVB-Ts are agile. You can do frequency agile as long as you're within the uh, channels of ATV. Um, you can utilize that. Uh, high des does sell the cent cent uh, 70 centimeter as well as um, uh, 13 centimeter or 2500. And so you can actually use ATV on that. And of course, the, some of the, they do have some equipment that's on 23 centimeter or, or the 1.2 uh, megahertz band. And so you can uh, pick up, you can pick up uh, what we call a receiver and a transmitter. You can set up both a DVB-T transmit station and a DVB-T receive station. And of course the receive station goes into HDMI and then right into uh, the back of the set. Now, of course, 70 centimeters, uh, very, you know, here in Southern California, very, very crowded. We got the uh, 430, uh, we got the um, uh, the 436 subband satellite subband, and so or 438 subband. So that's why we have our signals crushed down to two megahertz of bandwidth. And of course, I've been telling Mike and hoping we can get Skirba or somebody to have a channel so we can do full six megahertz. Because I did an experiment here when prior to deploying our DVB-T receivers, I went six megahertz on 434, and of course six megahertz on the receiver, and I had my high definition Panasonic AC90 commercial camera, and I looked at my video, and it was beautiful. <laughs> it was like you know commercial quality. It was broadcast quality, and so I'm like, we need six megahertz. We got to find it. <laughs> so we're working on it. So. Hopefully we can do that with uh, with 2.4, 5.9, as well as in 10.4 gigs that we're going to play around with. So experimentation is definitely a big hobby with amateur television. The SDR radios are uh, really fun, as a matter of fact. There's uh, you know quite a bit of information using new radio software. You know constructing a DVB-S or a DVB-T uh, receiving uh, station using these SDR radios, and of course they can transmit too. And so you can actually make a DVB-T transmitter. Uh, Matt, um, one of our new ATVers that just joined us, he is a digital guru, and he just picked up one of these Lime SDR units, and he's playing around uh, getting it perfected. And once he does get it perfected, he's going to share that program onto our website. So for those that want to get into SDR radio, both DV, uh, DVB-T receiving and DVB-T transmitting, we should hopefully get that uh, you know, sometime within the year. I guess we're still experimenting. Cool. Marty, you got your hand up. Yeah, another question, if I may. Um, uh, for several years ago, I remember there being kind of a, a dust up about uh, some consumer sellers that were uh, selling uh, uh, video uh, transmitters for the uh, first person video crowd on the, on the, you know, for drones and stuff. That uh, that were basically impinging on the amateur bands without a license, 
Is that still a problem? It's a huge problem. And the big problem is, is that uh, at least we don't notice it when we're transmitting on digital, just because it's a very robust, you know, QPSK as well as 16 QAM is a very robust signal. There are times we get tiling, but if I go back to analog using my analog VSB, and even with a 50 watt amplifier, I am getting hammered out there from these uh, unlicensed um, devices ranging from security systems, the wireless security systems that are being commercially uh, available, uh, drone operators utilizing 434 or people using 434, not realizing that they're in the amateur television uh, band, basically. And we're constantly chasing down um, transmitters that are, you know, quote, illegally uh, placed. Uh, biggest problem we're having right now is some of the mesh uh, groups, because when you're using mesh, that's uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 megahertz wide, and they're using uh, 58, uh, you know, 5.8 gigs, and of course going into 5.9 gigs because that's the amateur uh, allocation, and that part of that 20 megahertz swath is going right into 59.10 on our transmit, you know, from Santiago because Santiago is our hub of all of the ATV systems throughout Southern California, and so we get all kinds of artifacts and tearing and yeah, it's it's been crazy have you had so any success in getting enforcement from uh, you know uh, on on the uh, unlicensed operators well unfortunately we're not getting any kind of uh, help from the fcc <clears throat> except for if you know if someone's obviously uh, doing something you know totally illegal you know we can report it but it seems it seems that the fcc has a different uh uh directive now because it seems like money talks basically and we're trying to get the AWL to help us because we lost part of the three gig band um which is ma a major hit uh for the Arden network because 3.3 uh, 3.4 uh was removed but we were able to save you know the upper part of that band thanks to Mike Collis and the AWRL as well as the San Bernardino Microwave Society too and um so we were able to save it, but uh, you know, you got a lot of these services ranging from mobile now and five, you know, five G technology and all these different services are out there. And unfortunately, amateur radio plays what we call a secondary user. So, which is you know, eh. <laughs> really tough sometimes, but it's not impossible. We we're able to, you know, like I said, being involved with groups like say the Amateur Television Network. You know, we have chapters throughout the country, but they, you know, but they govern their own repeaters locally. OK, having an ATN chapter is simply a voice. And that voice is just, you know, like a big giant family to protect our frequencies, especially ATV, when we really need that six megahertz of bandwidth. And so when we're only utilizing on VSB or vestigial sideband, we're only using, you know, maybe a, maybe a meg and a half on video carrier, then it gets suppressed. And then 3.5 megs down is the, the what we call the color burst subcarrier, and then the 4.5 audio subcarrier. So all those frequencies are suppressed, and they're saying, well, since they're suppressed, we'll use other services that they're, they're not pointed to, like satellite and remote bases and things like that. And so, but with digital, it's a, a haystack, and depending on the width of the haystack is the meg, you know, is your bandwidth. And so, obviously, with six megahertz, that's a that's a big swath. That's a, you know, quite a big of a haystack. And unfortunately, we can't do that on 70 centimeters because of the other, other services that are on there. But it's, uh, it's a constant problem with, uh, for the, us um, using a, you know, high bandwidth per se. And obviously, we're getting into what we call the digital modes and especially playing around with ATSC 3.0 because that's something in the future that we'd like to experiment as well. Okay. Was that, uh, that answer your question, or Marty? I guess so. Yeah, yeah thank you. You're All right. welcome. I'm, I muted. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? Hands up, comments? Okay. I got a question from Jeremy, KE0LFX. He says, good evening, all. For decoding ATV, is all I would need is an SDR or SDR Angel. Yes, as a matter of fact, yes, you can. Um, 
Right now, we're, the only uh, repeater right now that's actually transmitting uh, DVBT is on Snow Peak on 1240 and at four megahertz. So if you're, then that's in the um, uh, Palm Springs, uh, Yucca Valley area. So just below um, Mount San Gorgonio. And so, yes, you can use SDR radio like the Hack RF1 or SDR Angel or Lime SDR, all kinds of flavors out there if you can get them because, you know, we're still living in a chip shortage. <laughs> Let me tell you, you know, trying to get a Raspberry Pi lately is like pulling teeth. And I just like to thank uh, Keith, uh, N6GKB. He donated two uh, Raspberry Pis to the ATN for our uh, um, SBMS meetings and for um, linking up. But yes, you can use uh, D, uh, Lime SDR, SDR Angel, or any other flavors. And yeah, per Google, peruse around. Someone's probably got some kind of a, a DVBT um, block for new radio, or if you're a Py, or if you're a Py, Python guru, you can uh, program on Python and uh, upload that into your SDR radio. Put in a a, a a 1.2 antenna up, and you'll be able to watch Snow Peak on digital. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Good stuff. Okay, there's more in text going on. In mm -hmm. chat. Well, it looks like Jeremy's in Iowa. Well, good for you. Definitely need to get a group together and get an ATV repeater built, and you can join the amateur television network. <laughs> Send us pictures oh. of your corn. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think I'll be able to decode that. Uh, yeah, not through uh, you know, Snow, since Snow Peak and, and Iowa is a little bit far away. <laughs> But uh, he has some old analog ATV stuff. And will I need to find an analog TV with a tuner for analog decode? Uh, yeah, well, uh, either analog or digital. If um, some of the digital sets still have the um, old NTSC standard definition on its RF side, uh, you can definitely take your remote and you can program it to cable. And then whatever frequency that transmitter happened to be on, whether it be 426 or 434 or 438, and there'll be channels 57, 58, or, fit, or, or, or correction, 57, 60, or 61, you can do that. So just, and it's so funny, I did an experiment with one of my Racy's uh, buddies, and, and I, he was a neighbor of mine. And I said, hey, John, you want, you want to do something really cool? He goes, sure, take your 434, uh, vertical antenna plug it in the back of your tv set just get a uh, you know just get a pl259 to an f connector oh i got one of those what are you, what are you gonna do i'm gonna show you something and so he did he plugged it into the back of his set and i said turn on the channel 59 i rotated my beam antenna right to his house are you ready are you sure and then three two one the energizer bunny shows up <laughs> with my face and let me tell you he freaked out he goes how do you do that <laughs> and that's how i got him started on amateur television and so we got an amateur television station at our fontana races group we have a eight space rack that's in our mobile trailer and if our mobile trailer ever gets um, disabled or you know can't move you can just simply unplug it and just take the rack out and you can go portable so got an atv receiver got an atv transmitter so they're good to go. So they can, so they can do, uh, you know, you know, point to, you know, uh, whether it be surveying or, you know, damage surveying, uh, all kinds of different things you can do for races. Okay. Well, we haven't got any more hands up. Uh, Barry? I don't, We're all going to chat. Well, someone, Nick from Texas wants you to explain a little more about receiving ATV with an SDR. As in, how would I decode it other than seeing it on my SDR Uno waterfall? Well, I'm not very familiar with all the SDRs out there. I'm, you know, I've been familiar with Hack RF1. I'm familiar with Lime. Um, but basically, it's, uh, you know, they got, you know, little SMA uh, connectors on it. And so decoding it, you know, decoding wise is just simply just, you know, installing the decoding software. Um, basically, if you can find a DVBT or DVBS, whatever flavor you like to try, and someone's transmitting a DVBT or DVBS, uh, you can definitely try that just by down, you know, either if you can assemble the uh, block diagram using new radio, GNU radio, free program, 
Um, yeah, I'm a Linux guy. I'm a Linux guy. Um, I've been playing around with new radio quite a bit. It's a lot of fun. Did a couple of articles about uh, how to make your own uh, spectrum analyzer using a cell phone, using the Hack RF1, and of course uh, receiving narrowband and wideband FM um, transmissions, and of course uh, getting into DVB. T and DVBS receiving and DVBT transmitting. And so with DVB receiving, it's just a matter of assembling, you know, the different blocks basically for, um, uh, you know, for receiving DVBT and then uh, hook up an antenna with low last coax. The preamp is definitely recommended for a, a SDR radio. And then um, outputting is uh, uh, usually RF and then and then, of course, right, right in the back of your TV set. Okay. That's all from chat. Okay, I don't see more hands held. Anybody got any comments? No comments. Well, it's been a great presentation. Roy, you did a great job. <laughs>